All right, let's head over to the Zoom line where we've got Scott St. John on the line with us. He's with Red Dirt Energy. May know him from Regan Smith as well, but Red Dirt Energy is where he's been focused for a couple of years now, at least a year and a half. And we're going to find out more about what's going on with that. Steve Bakken also on the program. Steve, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Not too bad. And uh, Mr. <laughs> Excuse me there for a second. Scott St. John, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I had a little coffee in my throat there while I was going to do the introduction, and I had a one of those after burps come in, so I do apologize to everybody out there. <laughs> Red <laughs> Dirt Energy. Now, let's yeah. talk about that a little bit. First of all, the parent company, Regan Smith, talk about them, and then how uh, just the genesis behind uh, Red Dirt Energy, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so uh, Reagan Smith um, is is a company that's been around for uh, almost twenty years now, and we started off rather small, about three people, uh, nineteen years ago. Um, and our focus is projects on federal lands and and Indian lands. Um, Oklahoma, uh, not a lot of people know this, but Oklahoma has a ton of um, both federal and Indian lands. Um, more on the mineral side of things, not necessarily on the surface side of things, especially when it comes to, to federal lands. Um, but Indian lands, it's very checkerboard. Uh, I can go into the history of how all of that kind of goes, but everybody knows we're the Sooner State, why we're the Sooner State. Um, it used to be just Indian territory. We opened it up um, uh, and that's where the land run came into play. And then there was the people that came in sooner rather than later. Um, and so, yeah, Reagan Smith focuses on the federal side of things, drilling permits on BLM, BIA, Forest Service, you name it. Um, we work all across the country. Um, so as a genesis to Red Dirt Energy, um, we, we saw a niche a couple of years ago when the um, when the Biden administration unleashed a tremendous amount of funds to clean up well sites. Um, and, uh, so we started red dirt energy as a plugging company, um, seeing that was going to be, uh, a, a, we thought a good business model to get into, um, and, uh, kind of turned our knowledge. We, we have, we have quite, we kind of share resources between the two companies, but with our knowledge of, of, you know, wells and how they're drilled and, you know, soup to nuts in the oil and gas industry, I would say from the land side of things to the environmental side of things, we thought that starting a, a plugging company would fit right in. Uh, my background is engineering uh, and also I've got a law degree. So uh, kind of work both sides of policy on that as well as the engineering side. Um, so yeah, we started about two and a half years ago in earnest. Red Dirt Energy has been around for a while, but uh, as far as a plugging company, um, it's been about two and a half years and, um, we've pl we've probably plugged in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 wells, uh, primarily working on state funded or, you know, federally funded projects for the state, state of Oklahoma. We've now moved into Texas. Um, we've had a couple of, uh, we've had a, we had, last year we completed a, a large project for the U S fish and wildlife service. They had 25 wells on a on a wildlife refuge here in Oklahoma that needed to be plugged. We were able to secure that contract. Um, so uh, now we've moved into Texas and we're we just got a big uh, contract with the Osage Nation. So we're super excited about that. You know, Scott, there's a lot of synergy, and I think uh, a lot of people don't realize it between Oklahoma and North Dakota. When you start taking a look at uh, the federal lands, the BLM lands, uh, the tribal lands. Uh, very, very similar between North Dakota and and uh, Oklahoma. When sure. you're looking at working through, because you have to work with so many multiple layers when you're looking at different agencies on the federal side. I mean, even just from the federal side within different departments, if you're looking at uh, uh, direct federal lands versus BLM lands versus uh, U.S. game and fish lands, uh, walk us yeah. through some of the the different layers because I, yeah, I, that can be mind numbing the paperwork and the, the channels you have to go through. Um, what is that challenge like when you're trying to do projects that um, are incredibly beneficial? Cause we went through that uh, same phase too. That's why I say there's a lot of synergy between North Dakota and Oklahoma with the abandoned and orphan wells and getting 
uh, making sure that those are, are secured correctly. And walk us through the process when you're dealing with so many multiple jurisdictional agencies on trying to do a project. Yeah, so um, it's it's interesting for so so for here in Oklahoma, I would say um, one of the distinctions here is we have we have a lot of allotted lands, um, not necessarily uh, tribal. Um, you know these you know people think of big uh, tribal reservations. Uh, Oklahoma is very checkerboard where it's allotted lands and and those are governed those are held in trust by the federal government by the BIA. And then also, so so you can have the BIA as a layer, and you can also have included in that would be the tribe as another layer if they have interest in those minerals. Um, and then when you're dealing with with those two entities, they actually sort of um, delegate some of their authority to the BLM as far as the technical side of things. So so you you can have a project that has BIA a tribe entity, and then also BLM. Um, and depending on where you're at, you could also have a potential where there is core jurisdiction if you have a wetland issue or something like that. So uh, yeah, there can be several layers and it is very challenging um, because everyone, even it's it's all, you know, the, the process is the same to a large extent, but each office and each BIA office has their own little um you know projects or their own interests that they want to preserve or that they are interested in in um you know it's just it's just something they want to protect or something so so you have to understand first who you're dealing with what bia agency you're dealing with what tribe you're dealing with and then you know it, it there is a lot of politics at play at times um, so you, it, it's good to, you know, we've been doing this 19 years from the Reagan Smith side of things. And, and it is, it is very interesting to, you know, we've, we've developed these relationships, especially here in Oklahoma over the years and know who the players are and know kind of how to navigate those things. I mean, sometimes we get tripped up for sure, but, um, it is, it is a definitely, uh, experience plays a large role in, in knowing, who wants what, when and where, and and how they want it done. Um, and then you add the BLM on there where, um, you know, on the technical side, the drilling side, or even the plugging side of things, um, where they have their own engineers and they have their own likes. And each engineer within the BLM has their own interests that they want to see things done a certain way. Um, so, Yes, knowing all of those things and having that experience definitely plays a role. But there was several years uh, early on in my career doing this that was very challenging. And it still is today when people leave, uh, new people come in. So, so yeah, there is there is that potential to have layers. We have a project right now in, in Texas where we've got Forest Service, we've got Fish and Wildlife, and we've got the Corps of Engineers all in one project. Um, so it is, it is, it is a challenge. I want to talk about the fish and wildlife project in a moment here, but just to give perspective to the listeners out there, how things have changed 10 years ago, I'm interviewing, uh, Missouri river resources, uh, and the, um, MHA nation, uh, man, Dan Hadikara, Hadisara. How do you pronounce that, Steve? Huh. Sorry, Pop Mandan, Hidatsa, and, and Arikara. Thank you. Uh, their their leadership has been very open and, and very accessible to uh, reporters and, and to different individuals. And so one of the things that opened my eyes, you talk about politics. You know, Missouri River Resources and, and the MHA Nation, they're trying to empower Native Americans through the energy industry. And the, the federal government, through the B, BIA and the BLM, they've got a 47-step process for this Native American reservation to go drill. When you or I or Steve or any other American outside of there can do it in three days. When they sure. were talking yes. about the difference between 47-step like, process, which in the government can be three years, 
versus three days, that opened my eyes. And I know that Senator Hoven, as much as, you know, I'll come down on him from time to time about some of the things, he was extremely instrumental in streamlining a lot of that BLM process. So for the people out there, when we talk about what used to be, that's what it was like. It was sometimes two, three years. Are you finding any of that politics is still existent with the orphan wells or the abandoned wells on the reservation, Scott? Well, um, so I would say that right now, um, it, no, because everyone's trying to get things done. The, the money is limited. Really what's going on here is um, there, there have been uh, federal grants provided to individual tribes and, and the tribes have had to um, apply for these grants um, to plug wells on their uh, on on their lands on their jurisdictional lands if you will um, the first round came out about a year ago um, and that money was approved uh, through several tribes this year um, or, or late last year and the tribes are just now trying to get their arms around it but um, one of the challenges there is uh, the, the first round of, of grants was uh, really pointed towards uh, allotted lands and, and tribal reservation lands. Um, the second round, oddly enough, was only ex it, it excluded uh, allotted lands. So that's been a challenge for a lot of the tribes in Oklahoma because they have so much allotted lands uh, and not necessarily uh, the reservation lands. So uh, that's been a challenge for a lot of the tribes in Oklahoma is now all of a sudden their footprint has shrunk in so far as what they can plug. Um, and so that's been a challenge. But in so far as what's what's going on now is is the. The grants have been issued. They do have funding, but the tribes don't have the expertise and the resources, human resources, to manage these things. A lot of times, these tribes don't even know where they're all, where all their allotted lands are, um, and and a lot of times they've been severed, especially in Oklahoma, where you've got surface sever, severed from from the the mineral estate. So that's challenging to research in and of itself as well. And, and some of these tribes are, 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 you know, having a hard time determining what exactly they own uh, from a from a allotted land perspective. So um, those sort of things are are, you know, challenges, not necessarily um, from from the grant side of things. There is a NEPA requirement, but it's very low level NEPA. It would be a categorical exclusion type of situation. Um, it's not an environmental assessment, but there is a NEPA com component to it because it is federally funded. So, um, but yeah, I know what you're talking about when you're talking about these, you know, this laundry list of, of, of requirements just to get something done. Um, and then when you, when you kind of add in to the equation, the politics involved, um, it, it, it can be it can be very frustrating. I know uh, it, in North Dakota, it was, it was uh, becoming a divisive issue because literally you could go across the street and drill. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, right. 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 <laughs> I mean, what's well, going well, on the other, here? You know, what, one of the things that <clears throat> early on 10 years ago, um, you know, early on when it seemed like there was a lot of, there was an influx of young people, young, young, younger professionals coming into the oil and gas industry. Um, one of the things that we had to educate them on was even though you're not on, you know, you, you would be drilling a federal, uh, a, a federal lease, whether it's a BIA lease or a BLM lease, you may not necessarily have the surface. Uh, it may not, the surface would be privately owned. So what a lot of people were assuming was, I don't have to do anything because I'm not on, on federal surface or BIA surface or, or tribal surface. Um, that's not the case. As soon as you, you're, if you know that your drill bit is going to penetrate a federal lease, whether it be BLM or BIA lease, and you're on private surface, you've got to get a permit and you've got to walk through all the NEPA steps and the NHPA, which is the national historic preservation act. So, there are that's the that's the misnomer in a lot of in a lot of cases. 
is that is that surface uh, severed from the mineral estate. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I wanted to ask too about the carbon market, and then we'll get into the um, game and fish. So, is is this kind of being categorized as as a carbon management? area of government or is this you know coming in from just specifically oil and gas or is there any sort of um certain earmark that this is coming from because it sounds like the business or the 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 grants or the funds are are coming from from the government yeah so right now i think i think the carbon market as, as it relates to orphaned wells um and plugging wells is 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 really the wild wild west wild wild west right now um so so you have uh american carbon registry which came out with guidelines specifically and only to orphaned wells as it relates to getting carbon credits um, for, for methane emissions when you plug an orphan well. Um, you've got another company out there called Carbon Path that, that has guidelines for obtaining carbon credits for orphan wells and private wells. Um, so they've added another layer. Uh, the, the, the driver to all of this is ESG and ESG scores. Um, we're actually red dirt is actually working for a, and I'm, we're under an NDA and I can't speak a lot about it, but, um, we're actually working with a company out of new, a, a global company out of New York. And, uh, we are doing some pilot projects to, to determine really what the market is like. Um, if it's lucrative, does it make money? when you're to, to, to do, to obtain carbon credits, when, when you're plugging wells, uh, plugging orphaned wells. Um, so the challenge there is, is do you have enough emissions and is it cost effective to go through the entire, all the steps, which is, you know, the st step one is measuring. Do we have, you know, you're going to measure those emissions. You've got to pay for that. That's about $10,000. Then you've got you've got the verification process, which you have to hire a third party certified company, MIQ, Project Canary, those kind of guys to verify your emissions. Then you go through the process of plugging the well and getting those carbon credits. And then whatever that carbon credit is worth, we don't you know, it's it's that that fluctuates. So so the cost, the upfront costs of even getting the carbon credit is, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to recoup that um, from that perspective. So, so that's kind of the pilot pro projects we're going through right now is really, you want to, you want to target the gas wells. Um, the shallow oil wells are not going to be very prolific in, in methane emissions. Um, and then you're going to have winners and losers out of those gas wells that you're plugging. So, and from the ACR perspective, the American Carbon Registry, their guidelines only speak to orphan wells. You get in a very gray area when you're talking about private wells and plugging those wells for carbon credits because you have to meet a certain, uh, you just can't go, you know, you have to meet certain criteria for that well to be eligible to get carbon credits for. So, and and also the, the argument is who gets the carbon credits on on private you know actual producing wells um is it the mineral owner is it the operator is it the surface owner do you divide it up to all of them there's a big gray legal area there that hasn't been well well established but yes the we, engineering uh, firm would like that but anyway <laughs> steve go ahead i, I know. well uh, seriously you, I, no I, you're I, right jason you're, like, you're, you're, steve think about this analogy your background is is music, even country music. If you were within a three block radius of a country music song being written, people were trying to claim ownership of that record. So I mean, this is the yeah. same yeah. thing, Steve. That's right. On private wells, yeah, that on private producing wells, absolutely. It's 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 going to be an interesting uh, how, see how that shakes out. Well, and I don't think people really fathom the 
grandiose nature of the value of a carbon credit yet. So, uh, and that's a discussion for a, a different time. You know, you know, one thing that you mentioned, uh, you know, trying to navigate between the surface rights and the mineral rights. And, and one of the things that popped into my head, because we're dealing with this in North Dakota right now with carbon sequestration projects, and this goes back to some legislation back in 2012 in North Dakota that, um, tied the surface rights to the pore space rights uh-huh. so now That's you've exactly got right. yes now you've got yes. mineral rights surface rights pore space uh-huh. um so differently like, are you dealing with any of those pore space issues like we deal with in north dakota uh, with what you're working through or is that not really a, a thing in other places yet so so no it's not um uh the, I'll kind of take you back in history of what you're talking about. I'm familiar with because in, in 2007 uh, we were approached by a think tank um, a startup company out of uh, Harvard university. There were some grad students that started a company and wanted, they wanted to do this carbon sequestration stuff um, only on federal lands. Well, at the time, uh, this was prior to any legislation or any rule promulgation of the 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 uh, what is it class six uh, uh, injection wells. Um, we had the first uh, applications out to the feds, the the BLM particularly, because we wanted to inject that. You know, that's where we were going to inject the carbon into was was federal lands in their pore space. Um, and they had no mechanism at the time to to approve those, that that action. Um, and we we for years, a couple of years, we were um, working with the BLM to get something done on that. But it never went anywhere. Um, but but that was kind of the you know, and here we are almost 20 years later. That situation has kind of started up again with the carbon sequestration, poor space, that kind of stuff. We're not seeing any uh, high-level projects uh, here in Oklahoma on on the carbon capture and sequestration issues, um, but but it is it is it's coming. We just haven't seen it yet. So when you're looking at uh, how states like Oklahoma or Texas are potentially going to navigate that because it is coming um you know like i said back in 2012 north dakota passed some legislation to tie them together now through further investigation there's also a, a little appendage on a second piece of legislation that in essence rolls sequestration projects over to the state and gives the state ownership of those projects which i think we're going to have a supreme court battle coming up because sure. if the state sure. owns the project then by default, that previous legislation, the state owns the surface rights. So has there been any discussion legislatively in states like Oklahoma or Texas on how to navigate that? Because it is something that's coming to other states like it has in North Dakota. And in North Dakota, it goes back to 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, not not that I'm aware of from, from, from the perspective of poor space. I will say that... Uh, <laughs> And, and I always think Oklahoma is, you know, they're so slow in what they do and how they react to, to different markets. We say that about things. North Dakota. Wait, wait, wait a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I bet everybody thinks about that, you know, but, but, you know, I, I would say as, as much as I think Californians are crazy and, and that kind of thing, they, they, they have their stuff together with respect to the carbon markets and what they're doing over there. I'm not, I'm not one that is, uh, you know, thinks that we should jump on jump on board and do what California is doing, but um, they're way ahead of the ball game on that kind of stuff. I will say that Oklahoma just passed some legislation last year that allows the state to um, get to to j- basically jump into the carbon credit market with methane emissions as it relates to these orphan well uh, orphan wells that we're plugging for the state. Um, that's that's great, but the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, which is the the oil and gas, uh, you know, basically the agency that's over oil and gas here in Oklahoma, they have to then take that legislation and promulgate rules to define how to 
measure how to obtain those carbon credits and who gets them and how they're out, how, how the funds from that's reaped from the carbon credits, how they're going to be allocated. I mean, it's a whole mess of a show here of, you know, the, the state legislator did a fine, fine job of, of passing that legislation, but now it's the next step of getting the agency over that to actually get the rules in place. And that's going to take years, years, the, the, the federal funds of, of uh, for, for plugging wells and, and doing, doing what we're doing now is, is going to be dried up by the time we get any kind of uh, rules on the books. I kind of look at the carbon market as it's very interesting because if, well, I'll give another analogy. One of the, one of the analogies I used to give in the energy industry was that to me, from a political standpoint, it seemed like California and New York were places where they would like introduce kind of extreme legislation, you know, banning gas stoves. I call that extreme legislation. Yeah, That's it's crazy, political. right? Well, it's just it's it's extreme. It's really different. It's like, OK, we just spent 20 years giving tax credits for people to upgrade to natural gas. And within two years now, you're saying I got to get rid of it. That's extreme behavior. That's not normal behavior. But California mm -hmm. and New York seem to introduce that a lot. And then they would play it out in Colorado. That that was what I thought was weird. It was like they were kind of playing, not play it in Peoria like the old days. It's like, let's, let's test it out in Colorado. I almost see that happening in the carbon market with North Dakota, Wyoming. And now Louisiana just got uh, privacy as well. So there are three states that you know one of the reasons north dakota can kind of have a history with this is because of that that i call it the super epa ruling where they get to kind of be their own epa and then uh -huh. you know you take a look at the blm from a federal it, it's almost like there, there are some states trying to do a grassroots or trying to figure it out on the local level but there is also this body of work on a federal, whether it be through the BLM or the BIA or whatever it might be, to where it does seem like there's almost like a top and a bottom approach to where it is gonna meet somewhere in the middle. I don't know if it's gonna like happen quickly, if it's gonna take a couple of years, but I do see where there are a couple different um, uh, vehicles driving it to where I hope they meet somewhere someday, because they're, they're, they, I don't know if they're going in different directions or the same directions, but they're driving different vehicles. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, and I think I think uh, I think to a large extent, and I, I I really wish this would go on is more is I think it happens to a, a certain degree, but I, I I'm I'm hopeful that someday these these you know the large oil and gas states, and this is for any industry, but but the 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 conservation agencies if you will that manage the oil and gas i i wish that the states like wyoming oklahoma north dakota colorado i wish they would all kind of come together and and have a consortium and brainstorm some some uh you know common common sense um you know approach to to these these larger issues and sort of come to a consensus on what's 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 best um, but I just, you know, but then again, you could say, well, what's best for Colorado is not best for Oklahoma. I get that, but there, there could be some, uh, a, a think tank or something like that, where these agencies come together and, and try to come up with, with common or, or, or very similar, uh, rules and how they apply so that, um, you know, some of these things can, can come together quicker. I think. What happens is you have some states that are very proactive, like Colorado, and uh, others like Oklahoma that are not so proactive, and they kind of do a wait and see approach instead of doing anything. And I think that hurts the state to a large degree. But I think also, on the flip side, Colorado is super proactive, and and their rules are very, I, I think, have been very detrimental to to the oil and gas industry. But that's that's up to the that's in large degree by who lives there now. So we're talking with uh, Scott St. John. I'm Steve Bakken along with Jason Spies. And, uh, you know, there's one other layer in that, uh, Scott, is, you know, the politics. And it, 
I, I agree with you. A consortium would be a great idea on um, fairly like-minded states to come up with a, at least a baseline plan. But yeah. now yeah. you start getting the the local politics involved, and I think that's where a lot of things wind up going off the rails for that's right. A myriad, that's right. A myriad that's right. of reasons. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the game and fish contract uh, you've got because that to me is fascinating, and, and from a federal perspective. Um, you know, we've got Theodore Roosevelt National Park here in North Dakota. So we deal with some federal projects uh, on a grander scale, um, uh -huh. especially when we're fighting, trying to keep horses in the park. But uh, different discussion for a different day. Um, but federal level, when you're looking at uh, game and fish contracts, how does that yeah. manage? Because I, I know our oil and gas industry here in North Dakota has done a lot of work in around navigating our federal park. Um, and then you throw game and fish lands onto that, which is an entirely different entity than BLM or other federal lands. Walk us through that contract, what that looks like from a navigational perspective. Yeah, so um, there were a couple of layers even internally um, with that contract. One was uh, one of the, you know, it, it obviously the the solicitation went through the sams.gov website um, and then once you secure that contract uh, you have a contract administrator which is in uh, milwaukee wisconsin you have another contract administrator which is in california you have um your your the person responsible for paying paying us and and the billing side of things was in an entirely different state um and so you're dealing with all these different time zones. Um, then you have the actual project manager on site, which is a biologist um, who, who knew nothing about oil and gas, nothing about plugging wells. Um, so uh, you had all these different players. And, and what the Fish and Wildlife did here in Oklahoma is they basically delegated technical authority to, to the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. Um, which is the the obvious the the uh, they're over oil and gas here, so uh, so you were dealing with those layers, and one of the challenges um, was you know one of the things I brought up immediately was okay you know we we bid these wells <clears throat> excuse me individually so each well had its own individual bid, um, and one of my questions what happens a lot when you're plugging a well is you may get, you know, 700 feet down the well, uh, or you're pulling, you're pulling tubing and your tubing breaks, or, you know, you, you've pulled that tubing apart. You can't get down there. You got to get a tool. You've got all this extra time and material. Um, and, or you reach, or on the flip side of things, you, you, you've got another technical problem where you've got collapse casing or, or something happens in the middle of, of plugging the well where you need some, a, you need some technical guidance, and B, you need approval to spend more money to get that well um, plugged properly. Um, that process, if I had one complaint, that process was rather slow. Um, on a normal basis, you'd get an answer within 15 minutes. Um, the answers were coming uh, in not 15 minutes, but 24 to 48 hours. Um so we made our best efforts to have faith in the system and just move on and, and get that well plugged and finished in the hopes that we would justify everything later on and, and, and justify that cost overrun and get paid for that cost overrun. But initially I asked that question of, Hey, I need answers in 15 minutes. Are you going to be able to do that? And their response was 24 to 48 hours. So right, right there told me that they don't know what they're dealing with um, when it comes to plugging wells, how quickly you need answers. You've got rigs, you've got, you've got uh, other equipment standing by, you've got all these things, you know, it's like, it's almost like drilling a well, but in reverse, right? Time is money. Everything happens quick. You need to get this stuff done. So that was one of the biggest challenges. Um, and then also, you know, 
the, the fish and wildlife would defer to those who see in a lot of ways in a lot of things, but then they also wanted to be in on all the conversations that we would have with OCC. So there was a high level of technical conversation going on. And then you would have to turn around and explain everything to a biologist and draw, draw it on a piece of paper of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I will give her credit. Uh, the biologist out there, she picked up pretty quickly um, within about a month of, of all the technical things that we were talking about. Um, but that was, those were some challenges. Um, and then, like I said before, the, the different time zones we were dealing with, with the contract administrations um, and then requesting, um, requesting change orders when we were going on, when we were looking at an overrun. So, so uh, those were some challenges from a technical aspect. You know, we didn't even know what we were getting into when we bid this project out as far as we made our best guess. A lot of these wells didn't have well records. Um, so we used uh, off uh, offset wells as, as our best guess. Um, and then sometimes you would just get in that well and it'd be, you know, it'd be easy breezy. Sometimes you'd get into a well that would take seven or eight days that was, you know, 1500 feet deep. So um, it just depended on, you know, kind of what, where you were at, but um, definitely those were some of the challenges and, and we were able to get it done. And, and the, the time allowed was, was three months to execute this contract. And we were able to get it done in three months. Um, but uh, we had the, we had the other challenge of, of daylight to, to dusk. Um, so we had to shut down and we had to shut down. Um, that was a challenge as well. And, and also uh, just being around, some of the sensitivities of the refuge, um, the terrain, and the uh, the soil was super sandy. Um, so we we had to get three uh, wreckers out to pull out one of our rigs one time, and it, to the tune of about a seven thousand dollar bill just to get that rig out. So there there were definitely some challenges along the way. And this is with the U.S. Game and fish, right? Wildlife. Yeah, this was U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They have a. It's called the Deep Fork Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's in Okmulgee County, Oklahoma. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, I, so. And you mentioned that uh, the state of Texas is next, or you're currently doing some work down there. Yeah, so we've got a uh, sort of similar to what we've been doing in Oklahoma. They're they're using federal funds um, and uh, we secured, I, I think there's about 20 pluggers that secured some portion of their budget um, to, to plug wells. Uh, they're a little different in this, this, I think this is the second round of that IIJA money um, is that uh, there is a, I've mentioned NEPA before. Um, there's the NEPA. There's a NEPA component now, which we thought was kind of odd that there wasn't a NEPA component in the first place. Because let me back up just a second for those that don't know, NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, you've got to comply with when when projects are federally funded or there is a federal nexus with that project, you have to comply with uh, certain environmental rules. Uh, as it applies to those projects and and that's you can you, it falls under NEPA which is the National Environmental Policy Act so this second round with with Texas um, they actually have to analyze every well from a NEPA perspective and a cultural resource perspective um, uh, before it can be plugged so I think Texas got hung up on that. Oklahoma is facing the same thing. I'm sure North Dakota is going to face the same thing that, you know, now there's this added layer of federal involvement before you can go out and plug these wells. So that is delaying things to a, a significant degree. I think Texas was ready to rock and roll back in March. Um, and we still haven't even got our first set of, set of wells yet because they're underneath a review. It's quite a change, isn't so, it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I think that's what Oklahoma's facing. Oklahoma ran out of their first round of money. Um, they're they're supposed to get the the money an, another round of money in 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 October or November, and they're telling us to expect delays beyond that because now we have to comply. And every and and here's the other problem: 
when you're dealing with state agencies like this, they don't understand the federal NEPA categorical exclusion, environmental assessment, NHPA. They don't understand that stuff. They don't ever have to deal with it. Um, so, so that's another layer of, of getting everybody educated on what needs to be done. Well, we, Steve Bach, and I know you've got a county meeting you've got to run to. You've got to put your legislative hat on or your county commissioner hat on. And, I do. Uh, do you have any... It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Th thank you, guys. Great to meet you, Steve. And I uh, appreciate you coming on today, Scott. And uh, Yeah, thanks, Jason. Uh, informing I really us appreciate a little it. Bit. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. you know, the thing that uh, people want to know about is you know it, what's going on out there with a lot of these orphan wells because you know there was there was this kind of this mad 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 dash for a while where some companies you know were getting millions of dollars and they haven't even plugged a well and so yeah. um it's good it's good to know that there are companies out there that are doing it they are you know companies that uh, have ethics and values and have experience and so um uh, red dirt energy one of those companies uh, where do you direct people for uh, if they want more information, Scott? Uh, our website. Uh, I think we are one of we are one of the only company plugging companies that has a website, which is, is very <laughs> valuable. Um, but yeah, it's uh, www.reddirtenergy.net, um, and that will get you to our website. And um, my my contact information is on there, um, and. Uh, uh, my my email is uh, s john at reddirtenergy.net. So if you have any, if you want to contact me directly, that's that's perfectly fine. 